that pop up for you? Yeah, it just says okay, right? Yep. There we go. Ta-da. Okay. Um, hello and welcome to Pot of the Damned. Um, I'm your host, Candy the Final Girl, and I have a special guest with me today, and that's Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hello. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing today, Candy? I am hanging in there. I think that's that's as positive as we're getting. Until it officially summer, I'm gonna be all congesty. So my voice probably sounds a little different today. But um, Ian is doing a separate project uh, this week as none of our, um, Nico and Ian and I, we couldn't get our times aligned. So Sarah has gratefully joined me today. Um, we are a horror comedy podcast and we um, can be found on X or Twitter uh, at Damned Podcast. We are on Instagram at Pod of the Damned, and you can reach me on Instagram at Candy the Final Girl, um, because I kind of cross over with that. Um, you can follow us on patreoncom slash Pod of the Damned for uh, one pound overseas, or in America for about a dollar fifty, you get full access to our videos and. Um, those are really, really, really fun. And we have a lot of little extras that we do, um, totally worth a dollar 50 and it helps us pay for our zoom fees for the month, um, upkeep on getting the show out to you guys. So, um, thank you for all of your support and, uh, we hope you'll enjoy because we are talking about tonight, late night with the devil from 2023, the movie that everyone is talking about. And I am going to just throw this over to you, Sarah. How did you come to see this movie? And what did you, um, like, where did you hear about it from? Well, definitely I heard about it from Twitter. And I was pretty much anticipating it for a while. So once it finally came out, I was jacked. And it definitely doesn't disappoint at all. I thought it was really cool the way that they had like the theme and the time period for it too. It felt very camp and it, it definitely surprised me more than I thought was going to happen. Now, what about did you see this on Shudder or did you see this um, in the theaters? I actually saw it on um, Shudder. Okay. So I didn't get the whole theater experience, but you know, you have your house dark enough. You got yourself reclined on your couch pretty much a theater experience had my own little popcorn maker going so i was ready oh i love popcorn makers i have a hello kitty one that like air oh, pops them. And that's so, so nice good. so good um yeah the night that this um movie dropped on shutter i was actually recording um there's a podcast in our podcast network um fe pod network um called horror flicks and guitar picks and it's our buddy tim runs that one and we were recording the Warriors. I was doing their monthly round table because sometimes I join the guys for that. And I love the Warriors. It's a, it's a 1979 film. Um, so it was having its 45th anniversary like me this year. Um, and so everybody's like, oh my God, can't you like right after this is over, you gotta go watch it because it just dropped on Shutter, And they had all seen it in the theater. So I was like really pumped. But actually the very first time I heard of this film, um, was, I don't know, maybe about two months prior, uh, to now, um, I'm a big fan of video games and one of my favorite series is Alan Wake. Mm. And I love the first game. I waited 13 years to finally get the second game. And the, in the subreddit that I'm in with Alan Wake too, everybody's like, if you, you know, there's a certain part in the game that is like the best part of the game. And everybody's like, you really need to see this late night at the devil movie because it's going to remind you of Alan Wake too. And I was like, huh. So it first entered my radar there because I haven't been keeping up with like um, my horror, you know, uh, sources or like mags or anything because the magazine I was writing for um, kind of uh, disbanded just recently. So I really haven't been keeping up on anything. So I hear about it in a video game subreddit 
And then it kind of left my mind again until I suddenly everyone's talking about it. And I was like, oh shit, I kind of need to see that movie. So I didn't get to watch it the night um, that we did the Warriors, but I did watch it like right after. And uh, the kids watched it with my husband and I, and uh, I don't have small kids. Everybody knows this, but I'll just remind you all 24 and 17. But uh, we had a really, really good time with it. I am so picky about my films this is a movie, one that talks about one of my favorite time periods, the 70s, um, that takes place there. And it it feels like you're in the 70s, like genuinely, without it being sort of like um, Ready Player One, where every single thing is like a reference to, you know, like, oh my gosh, look over there, it's Jimmy Carter, you know, or something, you know, like, it's not every five minutes saying, by the way, it's the 70s, it, you get that vibe. I mean, shit, Johnny Carson was still hosting The Tonight Show when I was a kid. I remember my, my mother watching it. So in 1977, you know, I wasn't too far away from being born. So it felt very organic. And, you know, once you really establish that it's in the 70s, you buy it, you feel it, and you you don't even really put too much more thought into it. And I like that. They That means they did it right. Yeah. I thought also the cast that they did was excellent for it. Um, I'm hoping I'm not butchering his last name, but um Damien Desmalchian. Is it Desmalchian or Desmalkian? Not sure. I think the first time you had it right. Desmalchian. Right. Phenomenal. I yeah, remember I he love also- him and everything I've seen him in. And he's also I love the in search of I I'm a huge documentary fan. And there's uh, these In Search of Darkness um, documentaries yes. about. Oh my God, I'm obsessed with those. They're so great because I grew up in an, a mom and pop, like, you know, so the smaller, but like and kind of senior um, video stores. Um, as a kid, my mom worked in one. So it was really tapping into my childhood. And Damien Desmalchian was was in it quite a bit. And so that had been really the last time I'd kind of given him a whole lot of thought. But every time I see him in something, though, I'm like, wow, he's so great. He's he's like really good. And he sells the shit out of this fucking movie. He seriously it's, does. It's magnetic. It is. He just draws you right in. And it's like your back must hurt from Carrie in this movie because. Oh, yeah. The beginning is a bit slow for me. And I was like, oh, come on. Like, I can't wait to see when it's really going on more. Yeah. And I think. Though it doesn't feel like boring, though it that, no, that it setup you you're wanting things to happen, but it, you're also kind of intrigued as to where this is gonna go, especially that, when it starts talking about the subject matter of like a possessed girl. It's like, okay, wait, are we doing a possession movie now? Like, it, you know, because I get a little weird about possession films. After The Exorcist, it's all downhill for me. You know, except for Jennifer's body. That that's just that's a good one. That's a fun romp, tongue in cheek. I enjoy it. It's like a popcorn movie, a junk food film, if you will. It's like a, a horror mean girls kind of thing. Oh, definitely. That's a great way to categorize it right there. So that's how I think of it. But it's like, you know, um, so that's another possession film I, I like a lot, but it's not great. Um, you know, really after the exorcist, like I said, everything's downhill. So I'm like Okay, so we've got this neat concept. We've got this talk show. We've got these certain things at stake that can, you know, competing with um, Johnny Carson of The Tonight Show. And, um, you know, um, his wife has died. We're getting a lot of information thrown at us, but it never feels like it's too much or too much to process or it's too slow because we're kind of moving in real time. Um, as we go to commercial breaks, we've got sort of almost like a documentary style or a found footage style of like real time where we're letting the sponsors talk um, and, and you're getting these real, you know, seeing him disturbed by something or real conversations or, you know, um, certain things that happen to certain characters. So it felt like just very organic. But yeah, I was a little nervous about a possessed girl. A possessed young girl. 
Yeah, because we've already seen that, like, at least maybe a hundred times by now in the horror scene. So give us a possessed girl with something different happening. Right. And I did like the um the cult aspects, too. We kind of get, like, a little hint in the beginning. And I love how that's going to tie somewhere into the story. Because you're like, okay, we hear a little bit, like, this guy has a background. Might have something to do with the cult, but we really don't hear anything else about the cult. That's just kind of, like... Here you go, a little carrot. And then what? where did that even lead us? And when we see these little brief flashbacks to this cult in the tall trees or in, in the redwoods or whatever, um, we see an owl. And his show is called Night Owls. So okay. for me, I was immediately like connecting some dots or, you know, leaving at least that possibility open that there is a very strong connection here. Um, with this and I'm just like okay so where is this gonna go so it was very much it, the movie felt like it flew by for me like it was maybe you know 50 minutes or something like it didn't feel like a full length movie because yeah. it went by very quickly like real time yeah it definitely felt like I was just like watching a show just right on the tv I'm like okay let's see what's going on with this program tonight and it just had like that nice flow to it. I liked how they were like introducing the other people coming onto the show. And you kind of like that little sense of like, oh, this is nice. Like da 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 da. And you don't realize what you're about to go on. You're just like going up on that roller coaster at that point. Yeah. And, you know, the characters are so well defined for, you know, just the little bit that we get to know them. Um, like the character of Lily. Um, she's unsettling from the very beginning and what oh, yeah just just by the way that she looks the way she speaks you know the way she dresses and that kind of cute yeah. little um you know jumper outfit but you know maybe she's a little too old to dress like that that's how I felt and I was like she's 13 I was trying to figure out first because I thought I kept on mixing up her age because like they, she was found when she was 10 but she's 13 now and I'm like okay I can kind of vibe with that, but I'm like, this is the tallest 13 year old I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And, and it, I think it was maybe the way that she was dressed. And also she has a very um, mature speaking voice. Yes. yes. And so all those things just alone are enough to unsettle you, not scare yeah. you, but just make you go. I'm kind of a little nervous as to how this is going to go, you know, because there's something a hundred percent off immediately about this girl. And, um, and then you've got Carmichael who's offering the, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to anybody who can prove that, you know, this, this mumbo jumbo stuff is, is real. Um, because, you know, he's a skeptic because he's a magician. He knows how the tricks work and he's, he's a hypnotist which is yeah. kind of an interesting thing. Now, I have some very, everyone has very specific, odd fears. Um, I One of mine is thalassophobia. I'm terrified of the ocean. Oh. Thank you, Jaws. Um, no, I'm, I actually will not go out in a boat if I can't see land. I love to fish. So like a little pond or a lake, fine. Yeah. And in Indiana, we don't have a lot of like even lakes. It's just mostly ponds. But the ocean, I will never go on a cruise. I'm, I'm afraid of the ocean. But another thing that I'm just yeah. oddly afraid of is anything that squirms, like not snakes, but like worms. Yeah. Um, okay. I particularly can't yeah. handle maggots. Oh, uh, yeah. At all. And and, I, and everybody's like, oh, Candy, you think you're so tough and you watch all this body horror. And I'm like, and that's fine. But you start throwing maggots at me like in uh, Fulci's, um, uh, what, what movie is that one? Um. The Gates of Hell or, or City of the Living Dead where he he put like 120 pounds of maggots that he threw at them and, and they're just slipping and sliding in these maggots. Now, I genuinely felt ill. Oh, so I bet. Fulci loved being just disgusting because God knows his <laughs> stories suffered and his scripts were bad and the acting was terrible, but he oh, could yeah. curse you out. Oh, definitely. I think it was House by the Cemetery. Like, I really like the special effects, but like some of the acting that was killing me. I'm like, I want to enjoy this. Yeah. But, but Fulci, Bob, 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 Bob from Hell. 
you don't sign up for a good performance or anything else. And most of the time it's going to be funny, but you go there for the effects that gross out and how far will he push the envelope? How gross is he going to get? How weird is he going to get? You know, cause I prefer much more like, like, uh, uh, like Jalo, mm -hmm. um, more of like the, the crime thriller slasher types. Um, but I love full shoot stuff just cause it's ridiculous. But anyway, um, that did that. I, I know I went off on one of my little Joe Bob sidetracks there, but, but yeah, so we get this, um, you know, Carmichael, this, you know, skeptical guy with his little twirly mustache, like villain mustache. God, ugh. Um, as a fashion don't. But um, he he tries to prove that this girl isn't possessed, that the things that they had seen through her caregiver and the woman who wrote a book about it, uh, um, what is, oh my gosh, her name. I'm blanking on her name right I now. I want to say chill. Oh my God, Candy is so unprepared today. Give me a moment. Um, I got this. Because uh, she's important, and um, I, I, I make this mistake every show where I don't write anyone's name down. Um, June, I was close. So June is the person who can speak with the demon Abraxas that's inside of this girl Lily. She, but she wrote also a book about it called uh, "Conversations with the Devil," that inspired. Um, you know, um, our main character to, to put this, um, this onto live TV. So maybe we can get those ratings. Maybe it sweeps week. You know, we really need these ratings. Um, you know, um, so that's, uh, that's our character, Jack played by Damien Desmalchian, but, you know, but June starts to get, and, and it's clear that, you know, June and Jack are sleeping together. Yeah, oh, I look at them when she's just about to go on stage. I'm like, uh huh. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. and so you know, she you can tell she's reluctant to have Lily do this, she's becoming unpredictable. Yeah, um, um but it's like, but I gotta say, come on, June, you wrote a fucking book about this. Yeah, this is kind now, of part of it, and, and there's like kind of a conflict of interest that you're also her guardian yes. adopted her, but you also like talking to this demon Abraxas that's inside of her that survived this cult, you know? Yeah. That, that part like always wriggled me a little weird. It's like you've adopted her. Did you adopt her for any good reason? Because it felt like she, this is now her subject, sort of like how um, years ago, different like psychologists would practice things on their kids. Like the one that did that, um, the test where the kid saw like a white bunny and there was always a loud sound. So anytime the kid saw like a white bunny, the kid would freak out. Kind of reminded me about that. Absolutely. And and that shit was so um, disturbing and um, caused a lot of problems for the children. Those those people who would do that to their kids. It's like, they're your children. They're not your, your test Love subjects. Mm -hmm. And it's cruel to do to any child, let alone... First. I couldn't do that to my own child. Yeah. Like, I don't know. But I think now that I'm talking about it, and this is when it always starts to make sense for me, um, I think I know why we get, why June is doing this. Why? Because for the ending to work, June has to have a little bit of villain in her. Yeah. A little bit of wrongness to her um, for everything to work out the way that it does. Um, with the ending now I'm gonna go ahead and say this um the biggest complaints that I've heard about this film because mostly it's been glowing reviews that I've heard um since it, it came out um but people like to complain about how it ended how did mm -hmm. you feel about the last part of the film I honestly really liked how the ending kind of like it tied down like all the different elements came together and you almost got like almost like a a revisit of like all the things that happened in the beginning and just seeing like through a different perspective so personally I thought the ending was phenomenal it really like sold it to me that ending and it didn't pull it out of pull you out of the film at all um, in any way because I feel the same way um 
And when I go into some of the reviews that people um, gave us for the show um, for me to share, um, you'll you'll see what they're talking about. But I'm going to go ahead and agree with you and disagree with them. I think it's necessary to get the full arc um, to have those moments. And it kind of adds a little air of madness. It adds an air of like come up and it adds an air of you know we get a little bit more um of our mystery solved and and by no means is it completely solved there's a whole lot more we could have gone into but we see um you know uh some the comeuppance that I think a lot of them deserved oh and and the whys yeah Yeah. So overall, um, how did you feel about the possession scenes? Do you think that they, um, at, with us both saying that we're kind of like tired of possession movies with these little girls, especially don't even talk to me about David Gordon Green shouldn't be directing horror movies anyway, because he ruined the the, the Halloween franchise that he did. And then oh. he did that Exorcist uh, Revelations or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Um, yeah that's gross. He's just gross. I'm angry at him personally. I get angry at people personally. Like, yeah, personally want to talk about this with you. Um, but um, how did you feel her possession scenes held up? I felt like it felt like a little bit of like how you usually see a possession thing. I also felt like there was like a little bit of like um, you know how like Japanese folklore, like the hair going down over the eyes. So I felt like that was a really cool illusion that they did for that. Um, I did like that they didn't make her super sh- creepy, but like she was creepy enough. Like just seeing like the eye color change and like the face, like that 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 felt like it didn't go like crank it up to like eleven because we'd want that for like later on. So I thought that was like a, a new take too because they just like had her like already like she's in the chair, she's bound to the chair. But like even just having the voice change and just like having the direction that she just slowly went straight over to Jack. Like, so I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, just, very, oh, very buddy. bold. And yeah. I mean, so of course I was expecting the voice change. I was expecting, you know, um, she gets kind of some wounds on her face. Yeah. And I feel like that was much more of just like a nod to yeah. the experts because you almost have to acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, to move past it so I felt like you know there was a little bit of that and it goes away of course when she snaps out of it um but you know and we get our typical parlor tricks and I'm not and they weren't actually parlor tricks in the film um but you know but the chair levitates yes um you know certain things it's just enough to push our our probably one of our smarmiest people in the movie uh Carmichael to say okay, neat trick, but let me show you. And that's when he pulls the hypnosis scene. I love that scene. Yes. it's But it, it freaks me out because oh, I'm like that character, like I can't deal with worms. And yeah. so we got some some pretty cool practical effects on that one. The practical effects on that were phenomenal. I didn't even see it coming at first. I'm like, okay, what's going over there with the neck and then the whole reveal thing over there? That was genius. So you could do so much, I feel like, with practical effects. And also, next time you see this movie years later, practical effects last an eternity. That's they hold why, up. Like John Carpenter's The Thing, one of my favorite movies ever. Yes. Just, just the creatures, all the different things, the camera tricks, all the things you can do practical it still looks phenomenal that movie now yeah absolutely you know um it's just it, it's fantastic um and i um i've always preached practical effects i mean tom Sweeney is like oh, an Sweeney. icon to me yeah, and same. my husband actually was going to go to his school um yeah. for effects and a lot of his um um students have gone on to be on more they were on face off Yes. And one of his students, Nora, um, yeah. who won, uh, I can't remember which season that was. It was an earlier one. I yeah. met her a couple of times at Horror Hound. 
um, and got to see some of her sculpts and things. Like, I thought she was fantastically talented. And to learn from Tom Savini, like, so I was yes. raised in an era where we talked about, you know, um, in, in the 80s, you know, being a horror fan, you're talking about the, the, the people who do this. And then, you know, so in the 80s, it was in the and you know, part of the 70s, we've got Tom Savini, like just, you know, the master of this, these practical effects. And we've got Rob Bottin. We've got, you know, um, Stan Winston. We've got, you know, all these amazing people that, um, you know, would either be nominated or would win Academy Awards um, for their work. And then it went on to later be K and B, which is you know Gregory Nicotero, um, you know who also was sort of an apprentice to Tom Savini. So they started working together on Day of the Dead, who is now known for doing The Walking Dead. But in the '90s, he did a lot of effects. But they were sort of the first to start bringing in CGI. And like when you watch a movie like Wishmaster from the '90s with K and B, bless their hearts, the CGI makes it look like fucking shit. Oh, CGI is brutal. Yeah. And and the movie is not good enough to save it otherwise. And because I can overlook it if the movie itself is good enough, but it's not. So this return to practicalness, this practical uh, effects, one, they're much more cost effective. Yeah. Um, so indie movies can really get in there. And indie movies have the, the chokehold right now on horror. Good. You know, yeah. small films like Terrifier, Terrifier 2, stuff like that, practical effects. And so oh, good it's so grisly like and t- they're gonna be timeless i mean that movie will never not look good just like i can go back and watch the fly cronenberg's the fly and yeah. it still looks great because of the practical effects so so yeah they did that right you know here and it's not like it's overdone it's not a gore heavy film but mm-hmm. those practical effects are pretty great yeah you know they're they're unsettling and and it's going so whenever you watch this movie that this and, and it becoming a viral and instant cult classic the way that late night with the devil has it's always going to look good you know Definitely. so when you do your rewatches and this has a very high rewatchability to it um it's going to look great do you know when he rips up in his stomach and those worms come out that's like a nightmare uh, that's it, that's from Absolutely. my nightmare. I get so excited for it too because I'm like I know it's coming right now and it just looks so good I've, I've just seen the movie just twice so far and just I love everything about like the acting in it from everyone is phenomenal the lighting like I'm, I'm a theater girl so give me good lighting in something I yes. felt that was beautifully executed just even like the different characters they they had on the show were good and I did like that our skeptic is also a magician. So I felt like that old nod to like Harold Houdini, because that was his thing too, that he would go after um, the spiritual movement, I remember. Yeah, and I mean, <clears throat> and you could tell that Carmichael, um, the, the actor who played him, and I apologize again um, for not having that name right in front of me, um, Ian Bliss. Um, uh, you could tell that he actually does have some sleight of hand oh, that he yeah. knows because it, it it's so like well done and yeah. so you know this is like a brilliant recipe if you were trying to save your show one the late 70s is the start of the satanic panic yeah you know, and i grew up in in the 80s in satanic panic oh you know? so it was a wild time to be alive and it leaves a leaves a mark on you in some way or another but um if your your show's failing and you're a member of this secret cult that a lot of powerful men yes because it is men um, men belong to um but your show's failing and your wife dies mysteriously and he even cashed it on that didn't he for real oh he so did it's like let me have my wife who's already lost all of her hair. She's just bound here. She's like, even like had a respirator, like. And she's saying how much she loves me. Oh, I felt, yeah. And he's, you know, squeezing out a few crocodile tears. Oh man, I want to, I want to. I I mean, I I feel like on some level, yes, he did have love for her, but I I just feel like there's not anything that Jack wouldn't do 
to I try feel like, to beat Carson. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I feel like he honestly, like that was like his end goal and he was ready to sacrifice absolutely anything, even the love of his life. He's like, you know what? If that's the price to pay so I could be king, because that was his thing. He wanted to have a lasting legacy. So he was going to get there one way or another. And I think he ended nice up with that lasting legacy, but just oh. not the way. It's one of those like monkey's paw type situations. Oh, You're going to get what you want. Yeah. But uh, it's going to cost you. It's definitely going to cost And it's not going to be the, you got to be very careful how you word it. You got to be oh. very careful what you wish for. Yeah. And so I felt like this was sort of a monkey's paw curse type thing. Definitely. Um, you know, but to, to, for Jack to say, you know, I'm going to take, you know, we, we haven't talked about Chris too, who I, who I actually really enjoy. Yes, I, I, I adored him. Yeah. And we get Chris too, who's like your typical, I'm going to read the room. And those people are really good at social engineering. Um, usually somebody's feeding them a little information or they're just able to grasp onto basic concepts that at least one person in the room is going to have gone through. Oh, and, yeah. then, you know, it's a lot of just social engineering, watching social cues. And so Chris, too, com- it, it comes off exactly as to what he, we think he is, which is a fake. Mm-hmm. You know, and we got Carmichael, like, kind of like, Ugh, whatever, this guy is such a fucking loser. He's a pain in the ass and he's fake. You know, um, he engineered this whole thing. But, um, but then, you know, he gets that weird, you know, where he falls to the ground. Like, he, he starts acting weird. His nose is bleeding. He starts acting really weird. And, you know, um, he mentions uh, Jack's pet name for Minnie. Minnie. Yeah, for his uh, wife. Yeah. Who has passed away, as we talked about. And, and Jack is rattled by that. Oh, I saw that expression he has when he hears the name Mindy. It's like, oh, I know who this message is so for. So it's like, yeah, when you, you know, for David S. Malchian to, to do this kind of movie and to pull it off as well as he did, there's a lot of understatedness. You have to do a lot through expressions, through how you move, how quickly you set down a glass, showing irritation, showing grief in in a way because it's not for the cameras it's for real yeah and he doesn't want and the for real stuff he wants to tone way down while he's playing up this for the camera stuff so yeah and poor christy didn't deserve what he got i felt so bad for christy i felt like he might have had some sort of like little bit of a spiritual kind of medium thing to him like all along but like not enough that he could like do what he could do with the audience but um it, it kind like- of reminded me and, and this is a weird reference um would be goldberg's character in ghost i love that one yes you yes know, like she's, yeah. she's working you know she's she's yeah. having people pay her to tell stuff that you know this is like a, a pass on tradition of just you know kind of swindling people out of their money by cashing in on their grief and yes. and christy is more of like that but just like would be goldberg's character oh wait there is some latent talent there yeah yeah there's something there and it kills him oh definitely it kills him you know um because her spirit is there but i don't think that it was her spirit that did that to christy well, i don't think so either now would you connect that to be in the same part of the cult that he's in or do you think that was a different spirit um i'm not really sure i i'm thinking more of like lily is really our power player here and with the demon abraxas in in there it's the demon that is really causing these things to happen and you know because from the moment that lily first you know gets to come on and meet jack she's like oh we've met before oh yeah He's very oh, friendly. I had the chills when Almost she said flirty. Yeah. Like a grown woman would yeah. be. A very familiar. And yeah. so, and she's like, we met at the place with the tall trees. And so, and they make that short reference to that in the beginning. 
that he was a member because it's sort of like almost a documentary style yeah. and going into the actual night of this thing this special broadcast where he's gonna knock johnny carson out you know for sweeps or whatever um by just putting it together a very dangerous combo because he doesn't believe in any of it of but he not. does believe in something if he's going and he's a member of that yeah. cult and yeah. they're sacked and he and it shows them doing some sacrificing he has to sacrifice something mm -hmm. to get the fame and the recognition that he wants to get the success and but i don't think he knew exactly what he was sacrificing which was his that wife was yeah no i kind of had that vibe too because i think he knew he's seen like that this place has done wonders for other people's careers so that's why he's definitely part of this this big boys club over here it's like oh we're doing spell work but we really have no clue what exactly entities we're playing with here you know, I think like some of them, maybe they could be like, oh, it's like, it's like a new acting thing. Like, let's do some sacrifices over here. And they have absolutely no clue what kind of spirits they're actually letting into their lives. It could be. Right. And it's something I always tell people, you know, um, like I won't have a Ouija board in my house. Same, same, same. I've always been like that when since I've I was been, a little kid. I'm like, my mom is extremely new age. And so like, I grew up Roman Catholic, but my mom's very new age. And so I, I'm well versed in that. I do tarot, but I'm very, you know, there's a very careful way to go about that. Yeah. Um, and mediumship runs in my family. Now that's, you know, listeners, you can believe that or you can not believe that. That's fine. It really doesn't affect what happens to me on any level. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have anything like super scary, but um, when you, you know, you're messing around, you want fame, power, you need to realize like, what you're asking and yeah. who you're dealing with what entity what spirit what demon what creature what anything what kind of power you're messing with because you don't know the cost and a lot of them will play tricks on you oh, and yeah. promise you something and why do they have to come through for you you know what i mean and might turn it around on to you it's like the spiritual scammers they're like here's this great offer for you there's no strings attacked. So all you have to do is just keep on going on your path. And of course, they come for the collection still. Yes. So I feel like he was joining this club, seeing everyone else is having success from it, not even believing in all this stuff. So I think he was just but playing just it like hamming it up. Yeah. And He's and wanting to be one of the the people with that kind of success he wanted it so badly and some people they do have that need for success yeah. you know um i've seen it just even in, in podcasting you know like i've been podcasting for over five years now and i've seen people who you know will become complete different people just because it's yeah. so important to them that enough people listen to their show for me i'm happy for one listener and i've said that from day one but, you know, in any type of entertainment media, there are those people who will literally do anything because there's just not enough love. There's not enough attention. And they want that success. They want to be known. They want to be important. Yeah. And, you know, don't trade your soul for that. It's not, oh, it's not what you think it is. Oh, it's not. And then when you get that fame and everything, you're like, was it really all worth it? Because it's I lost people that I loved. I lost my sense of self. I probably owe some kind of debt to some kind of entity now. Yeah, and um, guess what are you going to collect in the end? Yeah, and how's that going to go for me? Like, like, yeah. Was it worth it? Just so people can chant your name, people recognize you on the street, people like you, and, and you know, you there. I've seen people power trip on things. I used to be an actress, and, you know, even, and, and I was a musician, and I've seen just people who were big on the local scene here. I'm a, I'm a, a, a punk. Uh, I listen to punk music mainly and emo, but uh, you know, the hardcore scene in Indianapolis when I was younger, um, yeah. I dated a guy who was in a band. They weren't signed, but I mean, there was something about a guy in a band playing guitar and women went crazy for him. Yeah. And then that goes to his head and he thinks he's like, oh. No. some some celebrity and i'm like you're a local band out of hundreds just in this city like you know it's a power trip 
Oh, it is. That fame gets to you real fast. You know, and as an actress, it's like, you know, it, it, it becomes why I had to get out of that. And I ended up directing more um, was because it was like, well, I have, you know, 50 more lines than you and my character's on, you know, in all three acts and you're still in the first two. And, and I've done, you know, three plays where I'm the lead. And it, it just becomes like, and, and, the, you, and people can't step back enough and go, hey, this is high school and college theater. Every high school and college has this. You're you're a little guppy, you know. And it's great to, if it makes you feel good about yourself. I loved acting. Oh yeah, acting. Um, I loved singing and performing, but I never once thought I was anybody. I I never went. I never got a power trip from it. I did it because I enjoyed it and it was something that I loved. But I, there are people who are so hungry just for that. And they can't see that big picture that we're all just little guppies in a huge ocean. Yeah. There are a couple, there are a couple sharks and it's probably not going to be you. Oh, definitely. And I always say like, even on the art scene, like I'm a little small fish over here, but there's room for everywhere in the art community. Okay. All I say is, you know, shine the spotlight on everyone else too, once in a while. I think think it's very, very important to be, be better, honestly. Yeah. It's very important to be supportive in whatever your craft is. I don't do well in writing groups. I'm I'm one of those people, I'm kind of bossy. I like to be the leader, not because of a power trip, but just because I, I it's just how I, my personality type, I'm a type A person. That. So in and, and groups, you know, I'm reading, you know, my novel that I'm working on and I have like a lot of pop culture references and and stuff and I write horror and I write kind of stylized stuff because I'm into like if Grindhouse were books I that's what I write you know what I oh, mean that's cool. yeah so it's like it's it's it art to me but you sit around and people are like well I mean it's not you know Walt Whitman and I'm like I'm not trying to be Walt Whitman I'm that's trying to be me and yeah. you know but they think like you know well you know, you're not taking this seriously. I'm like, it takes you three months to write a poem. And I wrote a novel and it's good in three months. You know, it's, it's one of those things. It's so, no, I can't do writer's groups. But when you're talking about the art world, my daughter is an artist, a visual artist. And I love going to her exhibitions and seeing all the different art. And I, I actually wasn't a visual artist myself before I switched to art history. God, am I a nerd? Um, I preferred to say, big nerd too do it um but you know what I'm saying like there's always room and it's not about if you're doing it for the fame if you're doing any of these things it's always kind of a little evil it is and it's so hollow because guess what what are you going to have at the end of the day just your fame are you going to have close friends no are you going to have that love of your life still no because you usually have to cast all of that aside in this pursuit so yeah and and taking us back you know to the film I mean that's what Jack has done and you know and now it's become such an obsession for him to be more to be bigger than Johnny Carson who was the biggest late night yeah you know that he it had cost him his wife um it had cost him you know his happiness so he gets more obsessed the more miserable the more it takes from him the Mm -hmm. more he wants it I think it also like um, just a little segue with him is his relationship with Gus. So Gus was like his, I felt like he was like his wingman. He was like the one to do the little chuckles and everything. Yeah, but I like love Gus, he was sweet. He like um to see like that guy's demeanor where he seemed like all camp and like cheery, like aha, yeah, you got me, buddy. And then seeing how his tone started to change as the show was progressing. He's like, you know what? This is this is going a little too extreme, and no one's like listening to him. But I felt like between Jack and Gus, I feel like they might have had like a really strong relationship in the beginning of when they started the show, and like from how that friendship kind of deteriorated. Because even like he does that part when um, he's talking about like when he lost Lily, and Gus was thought he was about to say something about him. So I felt like they had a good relationship at one point, but this quest for even fame, like. Even your coworkers, you're not even friendly with anymore. Yeah, I mean, once Chris do, because Chris do has a, isn't on the screen for much time. 
Um, but Chris Sue has a huge impact, and Chris Sue shows that divide between Gus and Jack. Because Gus is like, we need to stop this right now. Chris Sue is dead. And yeah. this is serious, and I don't mess with this. And I, I mean, he believes in it enough to be afraid. Oh afraid and so is the crew they're like you know what one person's already dead from this like one person like that would be enough and, you know and they're just like oh coincidence don't oh. tell anybody keep that on the down low it's like no huh? oh yeah red flag at work right there someone would probably be like no. wow look at the time mm-hmm. gotta go don't give a shit about your show anymore mm-hmm. you know i'm done here yeah especially if you want to cover that up and be quiet about it Oh, and I yeah. think that that's why this works being set in the 70s because, you know, there's no social media, there's no smartphones. You know, the way to go viral back then was to get all the ratings to do something shocking um, on TV. And, um, you know, so it's, it's um that's why I like that they said it in that time period. And that's why I believe that they did that. I don't know that for a fact. Um, but it feels like that's why that it's, you know, um, obviously the, the exorcist exists, you know, it, it came out in, in 1974. Yeah. Um, so it exists. And, you know, at one point we have Gus who's wearing a, a crucifix, you know, because Lily is gets completely out of control with like the lightning bolts and her head splits fucking open with flame coming out of it. And at that point, I'm just like, what in the fuck is happening? Like, it looked really cool though. It was amazing. It did. It did. I honestly, I felt like that was like, you know how we had like, the classic possession and then we were like let's go balls to the wall so you're like you thought like she was creepy then guess what that was just a taste that was the, that was the warm-up act okay here's dessert that was almost like the let's get this exorcist shit out of the way first yeah. and then we're gonna do something completely different that hasn't been done yeah and you know for that to happen and then you know abraxas slash lily kills like Gus kills um her her caretaker slash uh you know um the doctor yeah the the parapsychologist that's what her name is what her her job title is kills her by you know uh sort of strangling her slash yep. cutting her throat yeah um I mean just everyone's dead but but Jack yeah and why is Jack left alive? And that's why, you know, and then that's our ending though. Yeah. Um, and people don't like how that's paced. And, and I'll explain more when I share people's uh, reviews on that. Um, but it's, um, and this is also for you, you Alan Wake 2 fans, uh, if this might either push you to one, play the game or two, if you play the game and you need to you need to watch this movie for this part you know he's reliving parts of um the past parts of the show he's on the show doing things that we've seen in just quick little flashbacks at the beginning um but he's like what the fuck's going on where am i what why is this happening you know down to you know some some scenes of him in his little ceremonial robes you know yeah. offering up something to this owl creature yeah you know? I thought that was so cool how like it just felt like you were just going backstage and all that stuff from his past was coming back to life to him yeah and he's stuck in it and it's hell and he's miserable and again uh, Damien Dismalchian like is really selling it with those expressions like at one point there's a shot i really really love and it's a gif i've been using non-stop on twitter um or x um the big uh you know sort of twilight zone spiral behind oh, yeah. him and he's got that like terrified look on his face yep. what a shot that was good it was amazing and so you know he's like oh shit i really fucked up 
Oh, yeah. And then, you know, and then he, he comes upon his wife, you know, who's lost her hair and she's dying. She's basically probably a hospice at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, end of life type situation. And she's like, you know, you didn't ask what it would cost and it cost my life. Yeah. You know, you said you loved me, but you, you put me in this pain and this misery and you cost me that my, my life, you cost, you gave me lung cancer. I've never smoked, you know? Yeah. And but you, once they said that part with the lung cancer in the beginning, I'm like, oh, that does not add up at all. Mm -mm. People don't suddenly just like get this type of level of lung cancer. Usually there's some contributing factor, like you worked in coal mines or like something. a yeah. smoker or something, but just spontaneously get it to that level, like stage four type level where you're in oxygen and you're dying. And basically the chemo is just prolonging your life a little bit. And chemo is a terrible, terrible thing to, to watch anybody go through. Terrible. And you know that they're in pain and you know that they're trying to put on a brave face. I mean, I've seen this and it's, it's just absolutely heartbreaking and horrible. And, you know, um, my husband and I both agreed that if we had cancer that couldn't be treated, we wouldn't put ourselves and our kids and each other through, um, chemo that's going to just make our, extend our lives by a couple of months and be miserable that entire time. We won't do that. You know, it's just, it's so hard. It's, it, it's stuff you can't ever unsee or unfeel, you know? So I have pretty strong feelings on that. But the, but the thing is, is though, but did she really know that? Because we, it's not really her though, is it? It's not really her saying these things to yeah. him in his little madness of, reliving the past and reliving the show and everything he sacrificed to try and 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 went and beat Carson and he he still hasn't fucking done it. Oh, he, he did it. He did everything else. Yep. Cost everyone else's lives, but he still didn't get the top. Right. And so I'd say I'd be fucking angry, you know? It cost me all this and I still can't you do it. Mm -hmm. I was tricked and that's how it works. Yeah, you, know, you gave them your power. You made sacrifices to them, and they they can fuck you over. You know these entities, these demons, these spirits that are up to no good, yeah. that promise you power, but they don't have to follow through on that promise. What are you going to do about that? Exactly. You know, you're just a plaything to them at this point. They're just like, how many lives can I manipulate and see who's going to go as far as they can? You're not going to get a reward at the end for what you did. So my question to you, um, while we wrap this part up, um, is do you really think that his wife knew that this conversation he's having with his wife is something like she's really trying to get a message to him? Or do you think this is the, the demon um, masquerading as her to say these things to hurt him? You know, part of me felt like she was like, completely clueless of like how she got the cancer and everything i don't think she ever thought it was like because of my husband just going to this boys camp because she probably is like oh you have fun with the guys in the wilderness have fun and then i do think maybe it could be that her spirit has been trapped by this entity so you know she could be like you put me here and this was kind of her last thing to say to him yeah i think either way it works really well and I think maybe they left it open for interpretation because it can't, it, to me, it, it can feel like a trick. Mm. Um, but it can also feel like this is the last thing that you're going to get to yeah, hear from me that you're going to, before everything really, the real cost, the real bill comes in due, you know, like she's begging, Hey, you need to kill me. Yeah, uh, because I'm so miserable. I can't be like this. I love you. And he stabs her. Yeah. But he doesn't stab her, does he? No, he doesn't. He gets his great ending for his show. That bill comes due. 
and he gets yeah it, it's a it, he gets that those high ratings but uh all you hear are sirens at the end yeah i mean it was a great haunting ending just the yeah. sirens and then the quiet yeah and even just like you know the he's way- going to fucking jail oh he so is there's no doubt in my mind over there and even just like how like um ominous it is the way that the camera is just tilting down to the ground like everything has been destroyed around him not even the cameras looking at him and all he wanted was that fame and attention yep and so yeah i mean it it, it costs him everything and he so and, and this is where the tricky wording can come in he got the ratings yeah but it cost him literally everything including his own freedom and yeah. of the lives of people that he cared about and the the lives the life of a girl that you know was possessed the life of you know a, a um a, a fake psychic who maybe yeah. has some like hidden abilities you yeah. know like all these people died and then you end up murdering one of them live on tv because it's live Mm -hmm. so yeah you got what you wanted was it worth the sacrifice your wife died for this yeah it's it's poetic justice it feels right he deserves it and just but yeah damien dismalshian like just really carries this film it kind of reminded me like um a callback to like the ec comics because like the oh, early I'm such a huge fan of those i collect them they have like just desserts at the ending for a lot of them yes like That's what, uh, okay. and they always told them like you know these neat like uh punny alliterations by like the old witch or yeah the keeper the vault keeper um i i uh i read easy comics a lot i just got the newest um uh what are those compendium uh that just came out so I read those and you are a hundred percent right. I didn't think about that. I like that. Yeah. So um at this time, since we've really we really kind of went through the whole movie. So um obviously if you're listening to this and you haven't watched the movie, um, this movie is intensely rewatchable and nothing that we've described can possibly give you the power that watching this film will. So yes. if you haven't seen it go see it it's on shutter currently it just dropped so it will be on there for a while um you know so absolutely check it out and um get back to us you know you can always email us at pot of the damned at gmail.com and uh because we, we like to do sometimes uh shows where we just uh read off uh emails and 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 people experiences and, and listener stuff where it's not just like about a film we like to talk about interactions but at this time i'm going to share some um of the reviews that i got from our friends on social media and this is from facebook this is um our my buddy mika she says solid nine for late night with the devil in my honest opinion, I highly enjoyed it, especially watching it in the theater. I have enjoyed it at home too, and I still enjoyed it, but it was a different feeling on the big screen. So we've got a nine out of the gate. Um, my buddy, our buddy, um, Tim over at Horror Picks and Guitar Flicks uh, podcast um, says... With a short runtime, a stellar yet mostly unknown cast, and practical effects throughout, Late Night with the Devil is a fun watch for any level of horror fan. However, the ending feels a little over-explanatory and shows the lack of budget through some poorly added CGI. With all that being said, it's a fun and rewatchable enough to earn... Oh, it's fun and rewatchable enough to earn a 7 out of 10. So, still pretty good score. Um, I have some kind of longer ones coming up. This is my bestie, Nico. Um, Nico Nice. Uh, not Nico from Father Damn. The, um, Nico Ross. This is Nico Nice. Um, so this is a long one, so buckle up. 
a clever supernatural horror film using the guise of 70s late night television as its background. The cinematography, set design, wardrobe, and dialogue enhance the feeling that the film is taking place live before a studio audience, voyeuristic view through the commercial breaks. David Desmalchian gives one of his best career, uh, performances of his career as Jack Delroy, host of Night Owls, the late night rival to Johnny Carson's The Tonight Show. This and his role as the polka dot man in The Suicide Squad only solidify his range as an actor. His portrayal as Jack truly makes you feel as though you're watching a real late night talk show. The supporting cast are equally excellent, especially Ing Ingrid Torelli as Lily, the survivor of a mass cult suicide that truly shines and nearly steals the film. Seals the film. Apologize. The only complaint I have with the film is the finale, as the ending goes slightly off the rails, trying to have a shocking ending. Um, hold on. Overall, this is a truly unique and innovative horror film that stays entertaining and stays with you after you watch it. Nine out of ten. There's another nine. Um. On Instagram at Horror Hockey Forever gives it a 9.5. And um, yeah, these are these ones are just kind of numbers. Um, on Instagram, Afterburner1978 gives this an eight. Um our buddies over at the Dissect That Film Horror Podcast on X gave it a seven out of ten. While the plot is very creative, um, it didn't really hit me like it did so many others, especially the ending. David Desmalchian does command the screen and gives the best performance of his career. I really need to rewatch it. But still a seven. Um, five, uh, a fave five from fans podcast gave it a nine out of ten. I felt it was a little too clean for video quality, and I really wanted to learn more about the Redwood. Solid movie with lots of enjoyable stuff. At Cinema Recall on Twitter X, gave it 8 out of 10. A very creative feature. Late Night with the Devil features great performances by the entire cast. I only wish the movie did not feature the behind-the-scenes footage, but use commercials like the WNUF Halloween special did to make it feel like a real show. And last but not least, Harker Jones says, 8 out of 10 career-making lead performance by David Dostmalchian and creative setting for an exorcism story. Love the 70s setting too, as that gave it a grittiness with the lack of our current technology. So, those are pretty great scores. Absolutely. But you see what I was saying about the ending. Yeah, no one liked the ending over there. Nobody, almost every one of those did not like the ending. Again, thank you listeners so much for giving us your feedback. It helps us with our score as to see where it places in our leaderboard. Um, that is upkept by our mathematician and great leader, Ian. I am not a mathematician, I, but I can dissect a sentence for you. I can, Anyway, um, so Sarah, let's hear your review. All right, so I'm going to go with eight out of 10 long trees. I thought the film was very fun. It's definitely rewatchable because I've watched it twice so far. And the second time I liked it even more because the first one I'm like, it, was, it felt like a little slow. The second time I went through, I'm like, you know what? It actually flowed so well. And just the way that the beginning kind of pieces together throughout the whole thing. I'm all about that full circle connection. And we got that from this movie. And the acting, the, the costumes, even like the set design. I thought everything was a lot of fun. Well, I 100% agree with a lot of that. Um, I am going to give this a 9 out of 10. Um, on House of Screams, we used to always, um, my old show we would uh, give something from the movie. So I'll do that just for yeah. funsies today. I'm going to give this nine out of 10 swirling spirals. Um, because I, I love that. I'm a big Twilight Zone fan. So it gave me kind of some Twilight Zone vibes. 
Um, but yeah, I, I David does Melchian. Like, I, I mean, you notice every single review and even our reviews have mentioned like, wow, what a performance. And it was, it really blew me away. And this is the, the thing that I will always think of him from this point out. Like, it's always going to be him in Late Night with the Devil. And oh, yeah. I, I mean, a movie like this really impressed me. A, a small budget, um, small budget horror movies are really where it's at these days. We're having a great horror renaissance, and the mainstream stuff has been a little disappointing. Let's like, for instance, Megan. That movie, me, I only went and saw it because I had free passes. That was garbage, garbage. Like it made me miss Chucky so much, and I only like the first three Child's Play movies. So you know what I'm saying? Like I need. I need him to say, you stupid bitch, you filthy slut. You know, like, I need, I need a little. But, but how was the entertainment of Chucky versus Megan on Twitter during the whole promotions of that stuff? I I was gagged. I was having a good time with that. It like was Megan, really cool. Chucky was saying something. So that was pretty fun. So I feel like they did really well on the socials for that. But movie wise, I don't know. I might see the second one. I'm kind of curious to see how they're even going to do a second version of this. It's, it's, you know, I, I have money, but what I don't have is time. We, we're all yeah. limited on that. So I, I sometimes I won't watch a movie just because I know that it's not going to be fun. It's yeah. going to waste two hours of my life. Um, right. And Megan, I, like I said, I would never have seen it if I didn't have free passes. So I even saw it in the theater when it came out and I was like, Ooh, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it's A24, which start out with a lot of lower budget, artier horror films. And then these independents that come out of nowhere, like Late Night with the Devil or, or Terrifier, or, you know, those are the movies to watch right now. They like Terrifier 3, I'm fucking excited as a family. I can't we are wait. excited. Yeah, because yeah. that's going to be a family affair because my kids love it and my husband loves it. I love it. You know, but these, these, uh, and then they're going to have a bigger budget. And, but I know that, you know, I've met Damien Leone and I, he signed my 4k ultra copy and stuff. I've met, um, I meet a lot of people. I do a lot of cons. Um, so that's some of the the extra stuff that we show on Patreon is a lot of my cool collection stuff. But, um, anyway, um, yeah, these are the movies to watch right now. They, they come out of nowhere and then they make a huge impact. And whether you love it or hate it, whether you like the ending or you didn't, you're fucking talking about it and not in a bad way. You're there's you're going to I have not met one person who at least didn't have one great thing to say about it. And I feel so bad that I missed it in theaters. But I just I had a lot of trips I and a lot of different things going on at the time. So I was just glad when it dropped on Shutter. I was like, bam, we're doing this. We're doing this. I have to do this because I'm, I'm so terribly curious. So just for it's, it's low budgetness for setting it in the seventies, which was brilliant for the cast. I mean, yeah, I couldn't, I want to give it a perfect score. It's not a perfect movie though. So it gets a nine. Um, but what I'm going to do now is share um, some of the other scores. IMDB gives this a, a total from all the reviews on there has a total score of 7.1, which is pretty fucking good for IMDb because yeah. people can be really negative. Oh, about. they go into sort of the theater critic snob on there for some reason. And I mean, I can, I'm a cinephile. I can be a snob. And, but it's just like, you know, um, whatever, I'm, if I'm dealing with movies or books or, you know, um, in writing groups, like I talk in a very pop culture fun way. I don't get super snobby, even though inside I can be, I, I could do that. I could be that person, but I'm having a lot more fun doing this. So, you know, IMDB, Hey, 7.1. That's fucking great. That is um, Metacritic, which can be brutal. They gave it a 7.0. Still good. Yeah. Um, now here's where you get to guess. Oh, okay. So, with Rotten Tomatoes, there's always a critic score and an audience score. And, um, you know, from one to 100%. So I want I want you to guess what you think the critics gave this. Oh, okay. Critics, they're brutal. I want to say a 76, because I feel like 
a lot of the critics, they don't even like this stuff to the begin with, but they still have to. This is their job. So I'm going to go with that. And, and then, you know what? I'm For for the critics, they gave it 97%. Are you serious? That is one of the highest critics scores I have seen in a very oh, long time. Critics, so so fucking bad. critics gave it 97%. Oh, wow. So now, what do you think the audience gave it? Okay. I'm going to go positive, but a little bit negative. We'll go with 98%. Would have given off a full 100, but I feel like that's too generous. The audience, now this is this is such an interesting twist of fate between these two scores. The audience gave it 81%. Oh, wow. When do you ever see that? Yeah, especially on a For low horror. budget horror film. That is so yeah. flip flopped, and the really? numbers are tremendously high on both. Yeah. And we've done films where it's been like thirty percent or you know twenty five percent. Yeah, they really came and out. We to did that. Army of the Dead. People were brutal to it, and I was mean as shit to it. I give it a two point five. Now that um, that's a very trippy uh, series. What a waste of my life! Mm-hmm. It was so boring. How can it be that long and have such cool subject matter and be so boring and half of the time i think for that one i always for, forgot they were in a apocalypse with zombies because they have like one movie that just you just like here's a glance on tv there's zombies happening but we're gonna do a heist it's so bizarre. yeah that's what i said i mean in our review i don't know if you listened to our episode of it i was oh, like there is it. way too fucking much going on in this movie yes like yeah. it did not know what it wanted to be and that it doesn't know what it still wants to be yeah. Am I horror? Am I action? What am I supposed to be? It's like, who am I? So yeah. I'm going to do what Ian does and share um a little trivia. I didn't vet any of this. So I'm just going to kind of um screw around and see what I can find. Um, okay, um, here's one. Um, these are all from IMDb trivia. Um, actor David Desmaschian was cast in the lead role in the film set central character Jack Delroy after films directors read an article by him about regional TV horror host, which he had written for Fangoria magazine. Oh. Co-director Colin Cairn said in an interview with the film's two directors published in this magazine, well, I mean, other than sure, just recognizing his awesome work and all the films he's been in, but I opened up Fango, which is Fangoria, one day and read an article by David on regional horror host. And reading that and knowing his work, I just thought, this is going to be a really good fit. Obviously, our hero is Jack is a TV host. So it felt like there would be some affinity there. Um, and I think that's neat. Um, my dream is to write for Fangoria one day, but... Um, oh, you sorry, should totally do that. Come on, send some things over to them. I'm working on it. Good, yeah, because come on, it's all about the... <laughs> And here's one. The name of the mysterious men only situated uh, men only club situated in the California Redwoods was The Grove. It was inspired by the real life Bohemian Grove located at um, 20601 Bohemian Avenue in Monte Rio, California. The Bohemian Grove's membership boasts several politicians including three presidents of the U.S. industrialists and other noted figures. One of the Grove's founders was Ambrose Beers, author of several horror stories and the cynical devil's dictionary the groves oh. rituals which have been described as falling between a cult and kitsch often include frequent images of owls oh oh i love that i love when we get a history lesson on one of these things yeah the, the, I, I love the trivia i'm just picking out a couple interesting pieces throughout here i didn't prep this out of time um uh well let's talk about my favorite writer stephen king for a minute Big yeah. horror novelist Stephen King has praised the movie. He said, I got a screener. It's absolutely brilliant. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Your results may vary, as they say, but I urge you to watch it when you can. So, That's something. High, those are some high uh, words. Um, Here's another one. Cult leader Xander Dab- Diabo appears to be based on Church of Satan founder Anton Xander LeVay. Okay, that did that did kind of remind me. Of I I got um, Anton Levey. I can't think of the name. I'm like, I know this face, and I can't think of the name right now. 
Yeah, I read a lot about him just because I have weird interests and I have lots of research books on different things. And Jean Mansfield, um, because I love old Hollywood, mm -hmm. she was a member of the Church of Satan. And he, uh, she had a pink altar because she her favorite color was pink. Her whole house was called the Pink Palace. And they were really, really close. Rumored to be lovers at one point. Mm -hmm. And she died a very grisly death. Mm. and Anton LaVey said a curse was put on her she was not decapitated though it was um she was wearing a fall which is I need because I have very thin long I mean it's not thin I have a lot of hair but I, I have very straight hair and for my hair to be bigger I'd have to put like a false hair in yeah it's like a weave basically yeah but they, they said she was decapitated and it was just her fall came out oh dang yeah so that's another fun fact that has nothing to do with the movie. Um, I'm finding some more. Um, let's see. The movie's late night talk show was inspired by the Don Lane show from 1975. The Australian newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald, reported on 2nd June 2023 that the picture takes its inspiration from the American born Don Lane and his eponymous late night Australian talk show, The Don Lane Show. So, Christu's stage name resembles two real life psychic mentalists. Criswell was most famous for his outlandish and mostly inaccurate predictions. He was a friend of uh, Ed Woods. This is a little. Oh, oh yeah. And well, like, at the opening of Plan 9 from Outer Space, that's Criswell. Mm -hmm. And also friends with Vampire. Anyway, Criswell was most known for his outlandish and mostly inaccurate predictions. And the amazing Kreskin has been performing mentalist acts for 50 years. Both made several appearances on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. As well, Christie's look bears a passing resemblance to Ravine, an Australian hypnotist who was popular in the 1970s. Let me find one more fun fact here. Um, um, traditional folklore states that if a person makes a contract with the devil for earthly goods, the devil comes to claim his payment in seven years. The documentary footage at the start of the film shows Delroy at the Grove in 1969. His wife dies in 1976, seven years later. Well, that was cool. So there's a couple fun facts um, from the film. There's so many um, out there floating around. Um, hopefully this, this episode has inspired people to um, go out and rewatch. And since Ian is not here to do his uh, calculations and his formulas, I don't know them, um, for putting it on the leaderboard, that will be announced later, probably at the release of this episode. But due to the scores that we've looked at, I'm going to guess it's, it's going to be pretty high. Where now? And this is another thing we do. Where would you guess this would land? And uh, we've done 109 episodes. Um, there's so many. I can give you um, a quick rundown of the top scores. Um, yeah, that would be great. That will give you like an, an access point. Um, yeah. Our number one ranked is Aliens and it has a nine out of 10. So that's with great. everything included, including those percentages, all listener reviews and the uh, reviews of us doing the show. Um, number 10, um, well, number 10 has changed. Like, okay, number 14 is Lost Boys. It has a five point. Oh, no, wait, these are my scores. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, this sounds vaguely familiar over here. Um, yeah, these are my personal scores. I did this wrong. Um, and I'm so sorry. Edit this out or leave it in and say, Candy's a dumbass. Oh, um, it's fine. It's school's night. It's all good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, this, is a, this is a girl's thing and um, we're doing our thing. Um, I'm going to hop on X really quick to, to give you the actual scores. Yeah, no worries. Because I'm silly goose. All righty. Um, I know he just recently posted one. Um, okay, so sitting at number eight is The Omen with 8.5. Grindhouse just made number 10. Um, okay. So it's in our top 10 because that's uh, the last episode. Yeah. Of that that was number 10 with an 8.4 so they're they're down to like little shavings of points so where yeah. do you think late night with the devil would land i'm gonna put your guess in 
I want to go with 13th place. I'm going to actually go a little higher. I think Ooh, I'm going to guess. Um, and I'm bad at math, so trust me, I have no inside info on this. I'm just looking at the numbers that I aggregated from everybody's reviews, but I still don't know how he figures it out. Um, my guess is going to be, um, I'm going to go with eighth. Ooh, that would be nice. Kicking everyone down right there. I, yeah, and I've been doing retro um, reviews for the shows that I wasn't on um, yes. back when I was still doing my other show, and I've changed a lot on the leaderboard. Oh, you did. I saw things move and shake. I'm like, and some people are probably out I was there. here for that. I was like, finally. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, I want to thank you uh, truly for being here and doing this with me, and I it's definitely want so to come back and do it again. I will. I'm taking up on that. And and hopefully with your first uh, go up podcasting, um, you've had a good time. And oh, I had a phenomenal time. It's so, so fun, right? Yes. And I would love to um, to have you back and maybe just me and you do some stuff here and there and get some girl stuff yeah. in there. I'm yeah, let's hear it. Let's have a ghouls night. Yeah, because I'm, I'm usually, it's just me and the guys. So yeah, not only be the, because sometimes I'm talking about like, you know, I got to talk about, oh my God, the way that she wore those, why was she wearing stirrup pants? Well, what was she thinking? You know, or something. Yes. Somebody will, they're like, I sit here they're, and appreciate it. Like, oh, yeah. Looking at her pants. I'm like, oh man, I couldn't take my eyes off of them. Yeah. But it's nice to have that feminine perspective. But um, if you want to hang around um, after, we'll talk for a few. But um, we're going to go ahead and end the episode again. Thank you for being here and everybody stay um, listeners. Um, please check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash pot of the damned for a pound or in the U S a dollar 50. Um, you can get access to all. We do these on video and, and you'll get access to our videos and our little extras that um, we throw in there. I record some neat stuff and I have a lot of, memorabilia that my house is like a museum and I have a lot of really cool stuff that pertains to a lot of uh the films that we discuss and stories that we I can't necessarily always share on, on the main show so please uh support us on there like I said we don't do this for money it just helps pay our zoom bill which is you know 15 bucks a month yeah so we can record and do things yeah, but sure. but yeah again thank you and um you have a great rest of your night and we'll see you again soon and pay attention for those leaderboards. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry about the dead silence. I'm getting this off recording.